Welcome to this introduction webinar to Persephone's Journey course, the online course. It's a most wonderful creation to the ancient Greek myth that is telling the story of Demeter's daughter, who is representing the passage of autumn into winter. And it's a course that I actually created this time last year, a little bit later even. We began actually last year in December, and we kind of had to catch up some, some of the earlier phases, but we went through it very quickly. But there's quite a lot of material um, and so this year, I wanted to really give us time to go through it at a leisurely pace um, so we can really experience the gradual changing qualities through the seasons and how we can integrate those qualities and embody them in our lives and reflect on, on what these passages mean for us in not only in this winter cycle, but also in the cycle of our own lives and the way we approach the end of one cycle and the beginning of another. So um, for me, it was perhaps one of the most um, amazing courses that I've produced alongside the Keridwinds Chase which comes afterwards in January. And uh, what I found incredibly illuminating about this course was that it really combines step by step the seasonal changes with hexagram qualities from the Chinese I Ching. And these correlate in a a very coherent way so that we get to see what are all of those little stages and their qualities that we pass through in this period from autumn to midwinter. And it illumined so well and so clearly this passage and the exercises that I created for the Flowing Asana series that carries us into that passage were also really energetically fine-tuned to these energies and uh, and then afterwards feeling that energy that was stimulated through the exercises there was time to reflect and to go inward and recognize where and how we might have met that energy in our lives and how our experiences correspond to that. And, and also, you know, if we have any energy that's stuck in relation to these, these steps along the way to the end of the cycle and through the guided meditations, there's also the opportunity to transform stuck feelings into enlightened gifts. And so there is a, a possibility to really release emotions and feelings that we may have um, acquired in a traumatic situation to a greater or lesser extent and to find the gift that is hidden within that. So we're also working with emotions and feelings within this course in a similar way to the experience we've had, if any of you have done the, the Shakti Dance teacher training, um, the rasas, okay? The nine rasas, which are the, the nine Indian um, in in the framework of Indian dance and music, they have these nine archetypal feelings, which they also learn to transform through movement and music and dance. And in a similar way, we're also working with that, with these Shakti dance exercises and then the guided meditations afterwards. 
So I'm not sure if any of you who are here uh, have already participated on the course. We had a few participants last year, but last year I was primarily focused on creating the, um, the course and less focused on promoting it with the intention to this year promote it um, after it had, so to speak, its trial run. Um, but uh, the few people who were there were very appreciative and I'll, I'll show you maybe some, some feedback from them later. So um, today I'd like to give you a little bit of a visual introduction to what, what the course contains, how it works, and what its basic benefits and aims are. And then I'd like to share with you two exercises, um, each of them showing you how the energetics work and uh, how we can stimulate the corresponding energies and then a little guided meditation of a few minutes just after each exercise. So you can get a taste of how that works. And then we can have some questions and answers towards the end. Okay. So let's tune in. And we'll tune in with Ong So Hung, just to really align our minds and come into focus as a group. And we'll draw up the spine, breathing long and deep, rooting well into the earth, releasing the shoulders, lengthening up through the neck and through the crown. And then closing the eyes, bringing the eyes to focus at the third eye point. Listen inwards to your breath and to also the cycle of your breath. So you ride it with your awareness, feeling the expansion, to the point of maximum, where the lungs are filled, and the depletion to the point of minimum, where the lungs are emptied. And we feel how even within our breath and this cycle, that moment of expansion is like the fullness of midsummer. And that point of minimum exhale is like the point of midwinter. At the Maximum of the inhale, we're in full vibrancy of life. And at the minimum of the exhale, we are returning to source. The end of one cycle and the begin of a new. Now, as we exhale, we allow our spine to rock back, bringing the abdominals into the spine, holding onto the knees and releasing the head and feeling the back of the head elongate and stretch down the neck. And then we're going to bring the arms up and we'll bring the palms together touching the crown and at the third eye we lean a little forwards and begin to chant on the creative sound bring the hands in a triangle as we lean back on the sit bones then wrapping the hands around we clap together as we chant so hung to the breast and then bringing the hands down to the uterus to embody this creative sound to then begin again, okay? 
So let's just gradually bring the arms up through the space around our body. And we're exhaling down, charging our magnetic field as we do this. And continue, inhale gradually up, the creative sound, so hung, that I am, that I embody. Last time. Inhale gradually out. Exhale and release the arms down. Bring your hands on your knees, breathing long and deep. And open your eyes and join me again as I share with you a presentation for this introductory webinar. Okay, so our journey begins tomorrow uh, on September the 10th. And this is the day when we enter into a phase of full fruition from the autumn harvest. After this point, we're effectively gradually entering into autumn and moving towards midwinter. That will take us through winter solstice, the 21st of December, and then we'll just go over into the new year to January the 7th, when we begin the phase of regeneration. And so the themes of this course are very much aligned with nature, with this experience of closing one cycle and beginning another. It is about the way we experience and approach the themes of letting go in order to experience transformation and renewal. So we're working with the death and rebirth cycle and Autumn is known to be this period of, of deep transformation. All the way through the year, there's continuous transformation happening. But this is a very drastic one where the sunlight really is fading away from our experience. And we experience that we're kind of like going into the earth with the rest of nature's vegetation. And so, of course, this myth of Persephone is giving us that experience of this passage. We experience what does it mean to have loss in our lives? And with loss comes also the experience of attachment and identification. And what does being confronted with having to release that which we have been attached to and identified with, 
and how can we become familiar and more trusting with that experience so that we can enter into the transformational process with less fear and greater ease and relaxation so that our passage from the old cycle into the new cycle can be smooth and also carried in a space of wisdom. So as we align with this period of nature, we also find that nature is one of the best ways to process our unresolved feelings, for example, traumatic feelings, our feelings of loss, of separation, of being lost and confused, because nature is constantly dying and being reborn, we can most e easily align our feelings with this process. You know, when we often have experiences of loss, it's when we go to the river and watch the stream pass by, watch the water flow by, that we might help to process our loss or when we go for long walks to process feelings of confusion, or when we might go swimming for a long period to work through stagnant feelings. So it's always when we come back and connect to nature that we're most easily able to process our feelings so they don't get stuck within us. Talking about going swimming or walking, it's movement that really helps us. So movement that is aligned with nature, her cycles, the images of her natural expression. So we'll be using the flowing asanas as such to help us move through these natural phases of decay. As said, we'll also be using meditation and the different scenes in the myth of the story will help us to release what no longer serves us. And the outcome is, as said, to be able to embrace this process of moving from the old to the new. And in the process, gaining greater clarity, resilience and wholeness, wisdom too. So when we contemplate the myth of Persephone, we understand that she is the fruit of her mother's tree. So her mother is Demeter, the goddess of growth and agriculture, also known by the Romans as Ceres, which we know from the English word cereal. And so all of the things that grow abundantly on our earth are like the expression of her magic, if you like. And so the most perfect ripened fruit, the most sweet smelling golden and juicy fruit that hangs from her archetypal tree is her daughter. And her daughter is called Persephone. And actually the name Persephone means calling on decay. So even as the fruit arrives at its most ripe, it is already calling for decay to come and even you know an animal that might eat it or the bacteria that nourish it all the other creatures in the world that nourish themselves from that fruit are actually causing that fruit to decay so the fruit was born to decay and in the process to nourish the rest of life and it's dropping from the tree and its fullness is that moment of the onset of decay. So while she is the full, beautiful fruit, she is also that which calls on decay. And her process is of losing all the flesh of her fruit, just being honed down to her very essence, to her core, to her seeds or her seed. And interestingly, her name, also in Greek, is Cora, and that actually means maiden, as in maiden, mother, and crone. But there is also an etymological connection to the word in English, core, which means the heart of something or the essence of something. So it's like her destiny, which is the onset of decay, is to arrive at the core or the essence of herself. 
And this is the process of death. Death strips everything away until it's just the essence, because only the essence within the seed of ourselves or of any life form can continue. It is through the seed that life is able to continue into the next cycle. So Korah must necessarily become the seed in order for life to continue. Let's just see a bit more about that myth. So basically, the myth of Persephone is divided into three parts. So the first part is the abundance, where we see her in her mother's meadow, in her fullness, in her juiciness. Here we see her in her juiciness. And we see then that she attracts this figure known as Hades, who is the lord of the underworld. And he's one of the three major Greek gods. There's Zeus, who is the king of the gods. And then he has two brothers. One is Hades, who is lord of the underworld. And the other is Poseidon, who is lord of the seas. In the Greek myth, Hades doesn't actually live in an underworld that promotes rebirth. He is basically a collector of dying souls, and he ushers them into different realms, a bit like heaven and hell and in-between land, according to their merits of their lives. But there's not like an actual regeneration phase going on in his underworld. It's all very dark and sad, although there is a kind of a heaven. But when he sees this beautiful radiant light of Persephone, he is besotted. And so he charms her and persuades her to follow him into the underworld to help brighten his life up a bit with this beautiful light. But of course, as she descends with Hades, that transformation into the darkness of the underworld, which is like into the darkness of winter, and she begins to lose all her possessions, which is essentially her flesh. And in the process, she feels trapped because at some point she realizes there's no way out of this decomposition. And she tries to resist, but finally she collapses at the center of the underworld in Hades' palace and enters into a dreamlike state. So that's the second phase. And then the third phase is renewal. Here we have another figure who enters the story, Hecate. She's the crone, the old woman who is presiding over the liminal states, the states between waking and sleeping. And she therefore also lives on the threshold of the waking world and the dying world or the underworld. So she exists on this threshold and she's often also there to help guide people when they have to make important choices in their lives. So she then comes to Persephone's aid at that moment. And with her, in this story at least, there are other ancestral goddesses and they encourage her to eat six pomegranate seeds, telling her that actually this is her way out. Now, this is a little departure from maybe the story that's most well known about Persephone, where it says that she refuses to eat, but Hades kind of tricks her into eating six pomegranate seeds. And because of that, even though she's allowed to return to the world above, because of the six pomegranate seeds, she is bound to stay for six months of the year in the underworld with Hades. Now, I think that's a distortion of the real story because it's the seeds, it's becoming the seed that enables Persephone to actually feed herself in the new cycle and experience new life again. So in this story, the goddesses tell her if she eats the pomegranate seeds and becomes herself the seed, realizing her destiny as Kora, then she will promote rebirth in this underworld. And in so doing, become also the queen of the underworld and revolutionize the underworld so that it doesn't just stop at death 
but rebirth can be initiated, not just for her, also all the other lost souls can be carried forth from winter into spring. So, yeah, you, you've probably seen my little taster video. Sitting in a vibrant late summer meadow, the succulent fragrance of the rich ripe fruits envelops you. A faint air of foreboding wafts through the twilight without skepticism or fear and step closer, open-heartedly with childlike wonder. Luminescent fungi and bacteria draw life force. The emotional weight intensifies, seeing all you have known gradually unraveling. The darkness consumes all light. You long to return to the world above and all you have loved there. There is indeed a way. The light at your core begins to swell and surge, revolving like a lighthouse lantern, and you are filled with a great sense of your regenerative nature. Oh, there we go. The whole Persephone story in one minute. <laughs> Okay, so to embody these cycles, I mentioned about the seasonal I Ching, which is um, a project that I've been working on for the last three years, where I basically map the 64 qualities of what are known as hexagrams from the Chinese I Ching. Each of these archetypal qualities I have mapped to a specific period of time within the seasonal wheel or the seasonal calendar. And in the summer, the qualities of the hexagrams map to a duration of roughly four days, four days each, and then go on to the next quality. And in the winter, it's eight days, more or less. So after the autumn equinox, the degrees of change move more slowly. And that's because the sun is withdrawing. And so the rate of change gets slower. And as said, these different I Ching hexagrams, they explain the qualities of each degree of change. And what I interestingly discovered while I was mapping this was that each of the qualities of the hexagrams actually describes uh, a real biological phase of growth within the seasonal cycle. So this is very fitting to then correlate these different stages to the stories of these different goddess myths from different cultures. Goddess myths, because mostly the goddess does relate to nature and in some way their stories inherently reflect a passage through a season within the yearly cycle. And so it's possible to weave the stories of a given goddess around the passages of the hexagrams that relate to that season. We learn to navigate life's transitions by embracing these cyclical changes reflected in the hexagrams. And this helps us to integrate the wisdom of nature, to embody nature's wisdom. And uh, using the myth, we're really able to relate in a much more psychological way to these different changes. Whereas, you know, if I just tell you what the different hexagrams are and their basic qualities, that might sound a bit abstract. But if they are embedded within a story like a myth, it all kind of makes sense. We understand the progression better. We see those images and we feel those feelings within ourselves as our minds are much more able to identify with such images. And these can help us move through the transformation and also find the key for that change, for that letting go, as we 
understand the nature of the journey through the myth. This is just explaining how, uh, in general, I have mapped the, uh, the wheel of the I Ching. This wheel was created by someone called Xiaoyong in the 11th century in China. And my contribution has been to map the different phases on this wheel to the different phases of growth of nature's vegetation. And there are these different archetypal qualities within the I Ching that are the basis of each of these symbolic hexagrams, hexagram because they have six lines, and they are created from two sets of three lines. And each of these three lines is called a triagram, and they have a specific quality which is similar to a natural force. So we have heaven, lake, fire, thunder, wind, water, mountain, earth. And in many ways, they're a bit like what we might call the yogic five elements, but it's slightly more nuanced than that. And it's more like physical properties. And these I've correlated to the different plant stages, bud, flower, fruit, decay, seed dormancy, seed dispersion, the planted seed, roots and shoots, and then back up to the bud. So we are departing our journey, and currently today, we are at the point of hexagram 19. This is today. We're still in the phase of the fire where the fruit has captured all the sunlight. And just over these last days towards the equinox, we're going to go through these, this last phase of the fire ruling season of the fruit. And then at the equinox, we then move into the thunder-related hexagrams. And these are related to decay. And they're going to be moving more slowly. So these first ones are moving once every four days. And then we're going to be moving once every eight days through our transitions of the thunder and decay. And then we're going to jump up here at winter solstice. Shwoop, and then we get the renewal period of the seed dormancy, which is ruled by the wind triagram, the wind energy. It's the purifying and releasing energy that helps to renew. So this will take us through actually until I think here, 33. So we're mainly going through the thunder period, a little bit of the wind and a little bit of the fire. And then the carried winds journey will take us all the way through until spring equinox. So that's some orientation. Yes, when we're actually embodying these qualities, and we're using the different Shakti dance flowing asanas. We're working with the hexagram properties, uh, both the energetic qualities and also the way in which they correlate to different parts of the body. And the 64 hexagrams, I have mapped them onto this shape, which is called a dodecahedron. And I have mapped that shape onto the human torso. And by doing so, I see where which hexagrams are located in which parts of the body. And it's an extremely coherent connection. And it also relates a little bit to the Chinese meridians. And so by creating exercises that stimulate these related points of the body, that relate to the qualities of the current hexagram we're experiencing, and also working with the energies of the triagrams that make up the hexagram. Together, this is very effective for stimulating the energies of that moment in the year. And also I've tried to make the exercises so that they 
are evocative in a kind of a pantomime way, an enactment of that moment in the story. So there's many layers of, of energies that are really helping to ground us in each seasonal phase that we're going through so that we can really conjure up what is that experience that we're meeting moment by moment as we go through this period. And this synthesis of hexagrams, myth and movement is what is helping to foster the psychological and spiritual growth. It helps us to get in touch with the energy and then through the guided meditation at the end to enable that transformation within us to release and shift, transforming the shadow that we might meet into a gift that will support us as we meet these phases in the cycles in the future. Um, just a little bit to the background of the, the myth of Persephone. It was seen also by the ancient Greeks as having a very potent quality to it, as it was really understood as the gateway to death and learning how to go through this passage into winter solstice and learning to release Everything that no longer serves us is really the same as us ascending into our soul body and becoming the essence of who we are. So it's basically learning how to die while alive in order to prepare ourselves for the ultimate death by recognizing who we are as essential being. So when we are stripped of everything which we have mistakenly identified ourselves with, we are left just with the essence of who we are. And if we can recognize and root into that, then when the time comes, it's less of a shock and we have a better capacity to navigate what is occurring for us in that ultimate release. Yes, it was for this reason, central to the Greek spirituality, symbolizing that process of birth, life, death, and rebirth. It occurred um, in a place called Eloisus, near Athens. It was a nine-day ceremony, and both Greeks and foreigners were invited. They were actually kept secret for anybody. Anybody who'd been there was not allowed to speak about their process in order to ensure that there was a deeper connection to the divine. And this was to promote that spiritual awareness or enlightenment of the deeper self. And this personal transformation of the Aloysian mysteries, it took place for over a thousand years. It was a, you know, a very established tradition and religion that, that went from about 1,500 before Christ until about the 4th century after Christ, helping initiates reflect on their life journeys, drawing parallels between Persephone's transformation and their personal growth. So if it was good enough for them, <laughs> then it, it can also bring us in our modern rite of passage a deep experience, a deep transformational experience as we, we use perhaps different modality through this course, but we reflect on the same principles and we, we find different ways to attune to those different principles. And in so doing, we connect with nature's rhythm. And when we connect with nature's rhythm, it helps us more deeply to move through our experience. Often it can be that, you know, we're in a cycle of death and rebirth that isn't necessarily aligned with what's happening with the seasons. And that may be well and good. But what we find is that when we align our processes with the seasons, that we get like an extra charge of energy through that resonance to like carry us on the crest of the wave so that it's easier to go through our experience and our cyclic change. Okay. So just a little bit of testimonials from some people who were on the course last year. Vanessa from Bahrain, Cornelia from Germany, 
and Marie Teresa from Austria. I don't know if any of you are here with us now, but thank you for your wonderful feedback. So Vanessa said, so beautiful, I felt the opening in hips, legs, a surrender to the stretching, the music, the movement, the blossoming openings as metaphors to help the body unblock and dive myself softly on the path to a transformation, to be reborn with more light, clarity, and awareness. And then Cornelia from Germany said, I've been very intrigued by the journey. In fact, at times I've been mesmerized by the story, especially week two has resonated with me and I'm enjoying the strong exercises. And then Mari Theresa or Maite from Austria, she said, thank you for this wonderful, enriching and complex practice. I find the vibrating images that arise through your words transporting me into the middle of the story quite magical. I'm completely enchanted by the rich symbolism and all the feelings that the story brings up in me through the rasas. I always feel so light and free afterwards. Thank you for this journey. So now I'd like to share with you just a little taste of this practice. And for those of you who may have been following me also during the uh, Demeter class that we've been doing some of the mornings, we'll know that there's a little crossover of some of the themes from Demeter's story and then into Persephone's journey. So today, as I was mentioning, we are just entering into the quality of abundance, which is that fully ripened fruit on the tree, the full manifestation. And as I've been telling the people who've been following the Demeter course, the part of the body that represents or, or that um, when stimulated, activates that energy of abundance is this point where the clavicular, you see this is the line of the clavicular, enters into the joint of the shoulder and it's called the acromium joint and particularly the one on your left side. So that would be that side if you're being a mirror to me. And this point is actually very close to another point, which is just slightly underneath it, which is here, which is the Chinese meridian point, lung one. And the lung meridian then continues down the upper inside of the arm to the thumb tip. Hence, we have in Kundalini Yoga this like exercise with the thumbs up. And so when we stimulate this point and also the acromion point, we're stimulating the lung meridian and the area of our body where we have our breasts and our lungs is the area that we absorb the, if you like, the heavenly energies, the divine energies. So for a fruit, it would be absorbing the sunlight, the prana, the life force from the sun. We also absorb a bit from the sun, but we don't have that um, chlorophyll for photosynthesis. But we absorb our spiritual pranic energy mainly through our breath and our lungs. So to be fully filled with that pranic energy, we need to work a lot with our breath. That's why pranayama is also so um, transformational and so invigorating if we want to stay healthy and full of spirit, keep us also more youthful over time when we work with pranayama. Um, but also if we stimulate this point through exercises, we're stimulating the opening of the flow into the lung meridian. So that's on one level. And then we also have as I was talking about, the hexagram energies within uh, this quality of abundance. And it is a quality of fire at the bottom of the hexagram. That, again, is the sunlight that's been stored within the fruit. 
um, and the sunlight is the fire stored within the fruit. And then above that, we have the hexagram of thunder. And in this position, the thunder is relating to like that very um, powerful energy of our soul self, um, a bit like when the Kundalini rises, um, there is a sense of greatness that can be overwhelming for the system if the system isn't prepared for it. But in the sense of when we are ripe, then that energy is um, able to be received. And so you have like this this greatness of this great charge of life force, which is the soul energy and the soul currents coming in to this ripened fruit. Um, so it's like a full embodiment of spirit self. Uh, so that, that's the image. So it's like a real sense of expansion through the physical body. Uh, so we're going to be working with uh, exercises that open, expand the chest, and that also uh, work a little bit with the navel to give that fire energy as well. Okay, so this is the exercise for today. It's the first exercise of the um, first part of the class. And... Uh, get the music for it. So each of the three phases are characterized by one track of music, each tracks that I have recorded. Um, and so each phase is actually seven, roughly seven minutes long. And so the whole practice together is 25 minutes long. Um, but we're going to be going through it very slowly and so you gradually you'll be adding one exercise onto the next. So you won't have like a very long morning practice until you get towards the end. But um, there are like these instructional videos and guidance videos where I'm telling you uh, the information that I'm sharing, for example, now. Um, and then also the guided meditation. So you need some time just to go through those. Um, so the image in the story is the moment when Persephone is sitting in her mother's field and she is that ripe fruit hanging on the tree. So I'll show you the exercise first before I put the music on, but let me just prepare the music. So we start sitting with the fingertips pointing towards the sit bones and the legs stretched out on the ground. And then we're going to open the legs wide. And we lengthen back through the spine as we exhale. And we try to roll the sacrum onto the ground. But we don't allow ourselves to go on the elbows, no, because then you don't get the stretch. You need to have the hands really placed a little further away from you. And you're pulling inwards with your abdominals. And now we're going to draw the knees in to the forehead. And then as we come up on the sit bones, we spread the legs out again. And we lean a little forwards and we'll start with this hand, my right hand coming forwards and up. And I place the back hand on the ground again to support me, fingers pointing back. And I lift the arm right up over the head. Now, this needs to be not over here and not over there, but directly up here. So we're stretching this acromion joint as we inhale. And then we come back. We reach forwards a bit, as far as we can, flexing the feet, and then allow the head to drop and the arm to drop as far forwards as, sorry, take my earring off, 
as far forward as you are able. And then we draw it back again and exhale and slide the legs in, engaging the abdominals and bring the knees to the chest. And then we slide forwards as we inhale with the opposite arm and reaching up. And gradually, of course, as you repeat the exercise, really lifting the chest here on the opening, you will also gradually become a little bit more flexible as you reach forward. Now, there is a slight modification to this exercise that we'll then go into a bit later, um, where we slide up and come slightly out and put the hand in through the pocket to come back. So we come up and actually then it becomes more of a round experience. So we're coming up, going slightly over to the other side, around, and as we come forward, we bring the hand in through the pocket. And the reason for doing this is because when you do this mo mo motion in a circular movement, we are really working and also bringing the hand through the pocket, this shoulder joint. So we're really stimulating that L1 meridian as we come out also through that 60 degree angle here. All right. So we'll progress through that with the music. And then at the end, we'll come into a stillness and breathe long and deep and experience that energy. Okay. So spread your legs out forwards, pull out the sit bones. And breathe long and deep. Opening your legs, bring your hands under your knees and draw up your chest as you open to the sunlight above you, imagining yourself sitting in Demeter's field, feeling the sunlight shining down on your face. And then exhale and allow your spine to go back as your sit bones rock back and release the head. Inhale up as you in. open the chest, bring the shoulders back. And then exhale, bring the arms forward. And inhale, bring the arms back, opening up. And exhale. And inhale and imagine how the trees are hanging above your head all laden with fruit then you can feel the fragrance of the figs and the peaches and the grapevines wafting through the air then exhale and bring your knees to your chest. And as you straighten and open, bringing your right arm up, and you reach up to the tree to grab a fruit and pick it. And exhale and slide back. And then over to the other side, inhaling up. And exhaling down. And lift with that fire energy. Expand and release with that thunder energy.
And now as you inhale, inhale through your mouth, through slightly rounded lips as if they're a straw. So you really increase the amount of prana you inhale. Now this time we cross the arm over slightly to the other side in a circle and then bring the hand through the pocket, exhaling back. chest as you put the hand in through the pocket. Exhale back and inhale upright. Just bend the breath, keep the shoulders back, lengthen up through the chin. Come forwards and exhale. And bring the legs in. Into easy pose, breathing long and deep. Feel that expansion in your lungs. And as you breathe long and deep, in your mind's eye, see that the prana that you are absorbing as you inhale has been charged with this spiritual light force, which gives it a golden color as it enters in into your lung. So as you inhale, visualize this golden light streaming in through your nose, down your throat filling your lungs with this gold and that golden energy being passed 
into the heart that pumps it out to embrace every cell of your body on the exhale. And so with your breath, you feel how spirit self or your soul self is coming in through currents into your lungs and becoming embodied as it's carried this charge of life force to every cell through your extremities through your arms, to your fingertips, through your torso and legs, to your toe tips, up your neck, the crown, and all your senses, sensory organs. You feel this light passing through all of your subtle energy channels in your body. And you might find that along the way there is a little block in one channel or the other, or a bigger block, or that your breath is perhaps not quite so free, the diaphragm is maybe still a little locked even after the exercise. And if you feel that there's like some subtle energy pathway that feels a little obscured or obstaculated, where the energy is not flowing properly, just guide your awareness to that area of your body and rest just neutrally observing how it feels, what sensations are arising as you breathe through it. And perhaps you can realize this as a contraction. A contraction in your system that diminishes that full expansion of your true being, of this presence that resides within your body. Like that part of your body is not really open to receiving your presence. kind of like a, a darkness that you can't really see into because you're a little bit locked out of it. And you can contemplate as you breathe what images that might bring up for you. What kind of limitation that might be. And that might even bring up some, some feelings.
why you might feel to, to be closed down in that area, perhaps for protection. Or perhaps fear of some kind. Usually fear of some kind that closes us down. And so in that essence of you that just sits and listens and observes, in the space of golden light, as you breathe, just gently bring your light self to that area of your body, surrounding it with your gentle, loving, compassionate awareness. Continuing to breathe gently. Gradually infusing this light into any areas that need illuminating. Just by being present with what is. Gently helping that by visualizing the currents of your life force with the exhale being passed through that area, illuminating and gradually shining through. Perhaps you might feel a shift, a little shift of the energy block opening. And as that happens, feeling that the light, the life force, the presence of being is able to expand more freely through your system, become more present more full, more whole. And then inhale deeply. And exhale. And inhale. And we'll come back and join each other. So I had originally planned to do another exercise with you as well, but our time is limited. And as you see, even just working with one simple exercise, if you really go deeply into it, it can actually take a while to go through it. So it's, it's good that we go at this slower pace. 
um, so it can be really deeply integrated. And we will be having um, also meetings with Zoom over the period. Um, so we have at the end of each uh, of the series, we will have a meeting. So let me just uh, have a look at that calendar. Okay, so here we see, this is today's intro webinar. And tomorrow we begin. And so the first phase of abundance, it continues for four days. And then we go on to being with family. And what you will find is that these will unlock on those dates. Okay, so this is here, this one, available on the 10th of September and available on the 14th and available on the 18th. And these are the, the dates in the calendar when these seasonal energies are actually active. And I will also be inviting you to experience how that's happening in the nature for you. For example, here, you know, it's thunder over fire. Last night we had a thunderstorm after months of no rain. Um, and, you know, this feeling of fullness, I can see all the, all the fruits on the trees, but there's also the sense of, of the heaviness of the water coming that's going to make the fruits drop. And then there's also, you know, how do you experience it in your own life? What have you been ripening um, within yourself or what projects around you? Then we have completion and adornment, which takes us through the autumn equinox and then the darkening of light on the 1st of October. And then innocence and following on the 10th. So we actually finish this first section around about the 17th of October. Now, what I will do is I would like to do once a week, again, a morning practice all together, and I will publish the dates for you. Okay. So that will be once a week, just to kind of like keep us going um, so that you don't like get lost somewhere. <laughs> And also we will have the diary section where we're, you know, writing our experiences so we can share that with each other. So then we enter the second stage, which is the descent into the underworld. The first stage was in Demeter's Meadow. The second is descent into the underworld. And there we have themes like following, biting through, shock, increase, resolution of chaos, all quite dramatic one through that period of late October until late November. And we meet again then on the 28th of October during Halloween to celebrate. I will be leading you in all of part two, even though you won't have experienced the last three. And then stage three comes at the 1st of December until the 28th of December, so just after Christmas. But we will meet for an early winter solstice practice together. There we will do also the whole thing together, all three parts together. And then as you continue, the last phase is just practicing the whole thing together, the full 25-minute session, which you should be very familiar with by then, until we meet again for the final closing on the 7th of January, just after Epiphany, which is a good time for that to close. And this course is ripe with also lots of juicy information about it, the overview and synopsis of Persephone's journey, for example, the emotional transformation through archetypes. And there's also a bit about the nine rasas, and the sentiments that we work through give you some information. 
So it's a, a very rich course. And my wish is it is for this to be something that helps to keep us together as a community as we gradually go through this. We exchange our experiences. We meet once a week online in the mornings. We meet um, in the evening uh, after each phase um, has been or each stage has been gone through. And, uh, and we really experience this changing and descent into the winter together. And, and what insights, what's the wisdom that we can glean from that? So I'm very excited to invite you to this course. I really, really um, look forward to receiving you and to sharing this, this deep experience with you. And heartily invite you to join. So perhaps you have some questions before we close. And I'm going to open the, uh, open the ability for you to speak. Hello. Yes. Hello, good evening. Thank you Hello. for this lovely introduction. It was very nice. It's actually my first uh, meeting with Shakti. <laughs> So that would also be my question. Is it, uh, uh, as I'm a total beginner, may I, may, is it also appropriate for me to join um, to the course? Okay, thank you for asking, Oscar. Uh, my first question to you is how did you find the first exercise? Did you feel able to follow that? Yes, uh, well, it was perhaps a bit quick, but also I'm a bit tired at the moment, but otherwise, yes, it was not, not such a problem for me to follow. Oh, I mean, okay. I do practice yoga as yoga, but I never did Shakti. Okay, so that's a that's a big benefit. If you are familiar with yoga asanas in general, then I think you shouldn't have any problem with this. Uh, there are maybe a couple of exercises that are a little challenging. A uh, one stretch in the first part but I give a modification for that. And then uh, in the second part, there are some more kind of like strength uh, exercises that are a bit challenging, um, but you can also modify those. And otherwise, um, if you are already practicing yoga, I don't think there should be a problem, Muska. So I just want to share that I did this course the last year. Yeah. And, uh... Yes, and uh, it was uh, really uh, fantastic for me uh, because uh, it brings you uh, slowly, really in uh, uh, a very um, uh, important uh, um, emotional uh, movement and brings you you can uh, you can translate for me, Sara. Yes, okay. <laughs> e, ti, questa parte di Persephone ti, fa, ti porta proprio a caricare, a diciamo, lasciare andare quello che non serve, ma ti dà proprio la forza poi per venire fuori dopo. Okay, so Sarah was saying that um, this role of Persephone, not only does it help you to release what you need to let go of, but she also gives you that inner strength, that resilience to continue to move forwards. Yes, and all the course, uh, very, uh, I, uh, I like it. Uh, it was, uh, uh, I, I think it was uh, really for me, for my opinion, the best course I have done with you. Wonderful. Thank you for your beautiful feedback. And I'm so glad that it was able to support you. I will do it again. Eh? Yay. <laughs> Look forward to having you with us again, Sarah. It's always a pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Looking at some of the benefits of this course, 
It helps you to align your personal growth with nature's cycles. Like I said, sometimes we have different stages of our cycles that are not quite in sync with nature's cycles, which can be okay. But as said, when we're completely aligned with the natural flow, it gives us more energy. It gives us that inner strength to go through. It helps us to learn to let go and prepare for renewal. It helps us to embody each phase of this process through the Shakti flowing asanas and thereby to distill and integrate the psychological and spiritual wisdom. It helps us also to heal, release, heal our emotions through the archetypal storytelling and then also through this meditative um, encounter in the guided meditation afterwards. As Sarah was saying, it helps to cultivate resilience and inner strength and to connect with the ancestral and seasonal wisdom. And the ancestral wisdom is also that which we have harvested from this last cycle and the previous cycles that we want to keep as the essence of our seed and that we want to take through with us. So we have to distill it so that it's really at its most pure and potent form uh, so we can bring it into the next cycle with us and in the process to prepare for life's transition, including the ultimate release. I look forward to receiving you and to sharing more of this journey, this epic journey with you. Take care and I'll see you soon. Bye for now.